Welcome to Jewish Boy Calls His Mother. I'm your host, Sadia, and this is my mother, Ima. Hey, Ima. Hello, my little sweetness. How's my baby boy? Doing great. Doing great, actually. Um, how was the Super Bowl? Did you watch it? No. Did you watch the halftime <laughs> I was, show? I was, I was on an airplane during the Super Bowl and in an airport. I was surprised, though. I thought the Super Bowl, I thought people, I thought everybody, they, you know, there'd be all these like the, the the sports bars, there'd be all these screens, and uh, you know people would be watching it all over the airport. And yeah, there was very little interest in it. When I was well, in I mean, the airport. I think because it's not like there was no Ravens playing. It, yeah. it, it was it was you know, but I thought it was interesting because you had the Bengals who haven't played in the in the Super Bowl at all ever. Um, were in the mm-hmm. Super Bowl, so I thought that would be like a really cool, interesting thing. I was rooting for them. Unfortunately, they didn't win. Um, but the halftime show was amazing. I loved it. I really like the halftime show. You know, on the talk shows, when I turned on the radio in the morning, next morning, Monday morning, they were talking about, uh, there were mixed feelings among people about the halftime show. Some people said it was great. Some people said it was awful. Like, I didn't see it. What was it exactly? It was awesome. It was just, a, 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 in my honest opinion, I think it was just, a, a people were unsettled by it because it just wasn't their cup of tea. There wasn't their genre. It was a lot of hip hop and rap music. And then it was a lot of, you know, people that I'm a huge fan of. Uh, Dr. Dre, Eminem, Mary J. Blige, Snoop Dogg, 50 Cent. Um, you know, it was great. I really enjoyed it. I think people just don't like that t- kind of music, had issues with it. You know what I mean? I remember, <laughs> I don't know if we spoke about this before, but getting you and your younger brother out of bed for school was always a challenge. And what I finally did was I just resorted to, uh, I call it Slurpee time, 7-Eleven. I would turn on the radio very loud to get you guys up in that bed and I would walk out of the room. Well, the next morning, when After I Super spoke Bowl, about yeah. the, the, the wardrobe malfunction that happened with, um, it was Michael yeah. Jackson's sister, I forgot her name. Janet Jackson Janet and Jackson, Justin right. Timberlake. When they announced it, both you and your brother like perked up a bed and went, what? <laughs> it was, it was, it was kind of odd. Like, I mean, that was nuts. Um, but people, people went crazy at that point. Uh, but let's get, let's go on to the main topic tonight. You said I, got a you, funny th- I got a funny story there to tell you about, you know, oh, we're talking about Monday, we're talking about sports. Did I mention mm-hmm. the type of, uh, that I was um, in the airport when I heard all the screaming? No, wait, no, I didn't say it, not, not on the podcast. I, mean, I think okay. I know what you're saying. What happened was, um, it was um, a number of months ago, I was uh, traveling, I was in the airport and, um, you know, we're in the, we're in the, uh, on the concourse waiting, you know, to waiting for the airplane. And all of a sudden you hear all these people screaming. I mean, like bloody murder. So everybody, you know, looks at each other and our mouths drop and we start whispering, like, what's, what's going on? Is this a terrorist attack? Should we run? Should we duck? Because these people are screaming like crazy. So I decided to ask one of the TSA people what was going on. And he told me, oh, he said, the, um, what team? He says, Green Bay just missed the goal. Oh, wow. All these people were watching the game in one of the you know, bar areas there. And Green Bay missed the goal. They, these people just went totally crazy. Oh, gosh. That's nuts. Maybe, Maybe sports, I guess. Sports is a good emotional outlet. It's a good escape. Yeah, say. because people, people can unite with sports. People can talk about that, you know. Um, it's just it's just an easy go ahead. But I was speaking to a guy in Shul, and he was telling me that, like, you know, even nowadays in the, in the workplace, like, even talking about sports can be divisive. So, like, you try to avoid <laughs> even talking about sports. Yeah, it's getting That's crazy sad. out there. It's getting crazy out there. You, you can't talk about anything. Everyone's walking on eggshells. This is not that's sad. That's uh, not that's not right. It's not what this country is about. But um, I remember um, oh, what was it? Many many years ago, I'm not a big sports fan, but I did see something interesting on um <coughs> television. <coughs> you okay, honey? All right. I saw something interesting right, no on problem. television that got that got me kind of irritated. What happened was, um, they they were um, it was during an Orioles game. It was Johnny Oates. Was the man was I think the coach or the manager might have been the man. Which one is the guy in charge of the team? John, you know, is that the manager or the coach? The manager is in charge of the team. Okay, the coach so, okay. helps yeah. the team win. 
Okay, so Johnny Oates was the manager, and one of the Orioles slid into one of the bases, and it was very obvious he was safe. The umpire called him out, and the player was like shocked. I mean, he looked at the umpire, and you know, of course, the gut reaction was he looked at the umpire and went, What? And so the umpire, because the umpire misconstrued it as um, him arguing, which he wasn't arguing, he was just surprised, like a yeah. lot of us were, like a lot of the spectators were. And the umpire said, Okay, now you're out of the game totally, because you, you know, he called it, you know, like a you know, I guess we're in Yiddish chutzpah, right? Yeah. So anyway, as I'm listening to this sports show on WCBM, and the they had two sports commentators. Both sports commentators were Jewish. They were from Baltimore. They were interviewing an umpire who was, who lived in Colorado, who was obviously not Jewish. Yeah. So they the umpire was talking about decisions, good decisions, bad decisions, what umpires based their decisions on that they listened to the sound of the glove, they listen to the sound of, you know, the, of the feet going into the bed. They, they take a lot of things into consideration. So I called this talk show and I said, I said my complaint was that the umpire misinterpreted the player's reaction as chutzpah, which it was, and it was, we were all surprised, you know, it was a surprise actually. And I said, Johnny Oates, instead of trying to take up for the player and I call time and speak to the umpire, um, did I said did bupkis? I used Yiddish bupkis. Yeah, bupkis. So the two sports commentators were both Jewish. Said to the non-Jewish um, umpire to go, "Hey, John, do you know what chutzpah is?" <laughs> so there's this. So there's this pause, and the umpire said, uh, "I'm sorry, I'm not from Baltimore." Ah, uh, that's cute. That's really <laughs> cute. Um, yeah. So just to get on, get on back on topic. You said you wanted to talk about the upsides of divorce. Um, yeah. You know, your father one time, um, this is really funny. Um, when your, my older sister um, went through a divorce uh, years and years ago, her first marriage. And she, even though, um, you know, she's not, she's like quasi, you know, she's not too religious. And her ex was raised the reformed of the reformed of the deformed of the deformed of the reformed type thing. Yeah. And so she, in, but she's still on a get. And he said, what do you need it for? We're not religious. She goes, uh-uh. She goes, I don't care how religious we are. I insist on a get. I want a religious divorce. So he said, okay, okay, he would do it. So when he was handing her the get, he was dropping it into her hands, he had to say this pasuk in Hebrew that you know, this is your bill of divorce, you were free to go to any man. Yes, say it in Hebrew. Well, this guy, <laughs> yeah, didn't know Hebrew from beans, and he started to stumble over the words to try to pronounce them. And your aunt just cracked up laughing <laughs> because of the, <laughs> the horrible, horrible way he was trying to mispronounce, he was mispronouncing the Hebrew. So later on that day. The uh, the rabbi who this, the rabbi who um, wrote the get sees your father in shul and he doesn't know that this is your father's sister in law he comes over to your father and he says to your father you know something I bring a lot of happiness to people's lives and your father says to him you he says yeah you should see these divorced couples I had one this afternoon oh the wife was laughing and laughing and laughing she was so happy and, and your father says oh that was my sister-in-law <laughs> yeah um honestly for for me i think like as long as everyone's cordial and it's like it's it's a very it's a very unnerving time it's like diffusing a a, a time bomb where it's like you got to be very careful because if you do it well enough, you'll get out scot free, no big deal. You'll be out, no like no problems. One wrong move, and it could be like years with lawyers and a bunch of train wreck of stuff. You know, you hear horror stories. Um, sure. Yep, that's for sure. Yeah, it's just I I got lucky in a sense where like we both had seichel and we both just wanted out, and that's why Maryland has that thirty day process where like as long as you're you know as long as you 
both can agree on the property and whatnot. We didn't have anything together. We really had nothing. We, we literally had bubkis. Um, and I remember it was so funny. We were even writing down, we had to write down like this whole document of our property and like, there was nothing. So we just like wrote down like we, the signed blah, 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 agreed to just have split it in half, like just whatever. And the judge looks at it, looks at us, looks back and just starts like, smiling being like wow this is like <laughs> holy crap um and, and what's, the, what's the judge smiling because he knew you guys had nothing or what it just we no it just we just were amicable we just we wanted it over we wanted to create the split we wanted to get it done um uh, and it's just it's like because it just doesn't the biggest thing is is that like i really didn't know what i was doing in the relationship to really know when to get out in the first place um I think I was always taught to not let go of our relationship and only at the end when everything was just so broken down and I just mm -hmm. decided to just let it all go that like, I'm like, wow, I could have prevented all of this by just, you know, it's sort of like just breaking up when I should have, instead of dragging this whole thing out and trying to mm -hmm. fix something that was already broken and that shouldn't have been put together. Well, I think uh, that was probably because like the, I raised you kids the way I was raised in our generation. We were taught that you just don't walk out of a difficult situation, that you try to work with it. You try to see it through unless it's like totally impossible. No, you, you try to give it your all. <laughs> that's the way I raised your kids. And I think that's the reason probably why you stuck with the relationship, because I've ingrained it in you children so much not to walk. Not to, not to uh, walk out of a difficult of a difficult situation. Yeah, but I think if I had the experience of being in a relationship, that, this was my first relationship ever in my entire right. life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think I think if I had more experience, I wouldn't have done. I would have just saw the red flags from the beginning and ended it within the first couple of days, instead of mm -hmm. being confused, not knowing what to do, and kind of dragging it out for seven years. You know, that's well, but at least you can comfort yourself with one thought. You gave it your all. Whereas who knows, maybe had you gotten out earlier, it, you would have always like thought to yourself, maybe I should have tried harder. Maybe I should have worked with it more. Whereas, you know, you gave it your all. You really tried to work with it. And until it was obvious that this it was, was obvious from the beginning. That's it, the it frustrating thing. It so? was obvious from the beginning. There were so many red flags. Looking back, there were so many things like we were just totally two different people that wanted to do different things out of life. You know, like she wanted a more country style life. I wanted a more city life. Like that's like, that sounds kind of silly and, and almost like, you know, bare bones, basic, you know, stuff. But it, it's, it really means a lot when it's like, I like socializing with people and hanging out with people and, 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 and talking to new people and meeting new people. And the other person wants to be a total introvert and not do anything at all. And that if you try to convince them to do something, it just turns to a whole massive argument of like, are you trying to change me or tell me what to do? And I'm like, I'm just trying to, you know, live my life with you. And it, that's the other problem is that when you're trying to live your life with another person who's not like you, and I'm talking about not like you, not that opposites attract, quote unquote, which I don't believe in. I don't think opposites attract. <laughs> I think opposites are terrible. I think, I think <laughs> get involved in a relationship with someone who's very similar to you. Um, there might be some differences here and there, little nuances. Maybe I would say mm -hmm. like 10, 15% of differences, but you should have a lot mm -hmm. in common. You should practically yes. be almost the same person before you like meet, so to speak, because this whole opposite track thing, this whole like, I, I, I personally had issues with, with romantic comedies because they damaged, at least in my opinion, like so much of a perspective of what a man's supposed to be, what a woman's supposed to be, what a relationship's supposed to be. Where like you start creating this 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 idea, this high and mighty like knight in shining armor attitude, which just gets worn out. Um, that's my problem. Like, I I believe in this knight in shining armor bit. That was just really terrible, and like a really big waste of my time. Well, the idea of of the media um, giving our young people a skewed view on marriage and married life is something that's centuries old, Flaubert, 
the famous French writer. That was the whole point of Madame Bovary, his famous, um, I, think, I think he wrote it in the 1840s, his famous novel was that as a teenage girl, she got involved reading these beautiful romance novels. You know, like you said, Knight in Shining Armor, you know, uh, romantic relationships. And it gave her a very unrealistic uh, picture of what to expect in a marriage. Yeah. So even yeah. Through, the, the media at the time, of course, was books. It's but it's, it's, today we have you know television and movies, yeah, things like it's, that. It's romanticism in itself. It's just is so frustratingly like stupid and silly. That's kind of why I like the shidduch world, so to speak, on, on paper. Um, I know some people have issues with it and they struggle with it and they have problems with it. Mm -hmm. And there's tons of stories and blogs and everyone complaining about the shidduch crisis, blah 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 blah. But end of the day, at least in my opinion, from my experience, you know. Having that shidduch, the shidduch dating world, what it does is it, it breaks that barrier of, well, when do I talk about this? Or when do we discuss this? Well, I should have mentioned that. Like, no, off the bat, do you want to have kids? If so, how many? Mm -hmm. you know, what do you want out of your man? What do you want out of your woman? And you ask them those questions yeah. very straightforward. It's like, well, it's a little abrasive, but it gets the job done. You, you oh, yeah. don't waste seven years of relationship, eight years, 10 years, 15 years. <laughs> because you were too shy or too awkward or not sure when to ask these questions. Mm. Here you are suckered into a relationship that you should have asked this within the first day. You're, so, you're talking about, you know, it, it's so, what you said is so meaningful about having goals in common. And I think that's where you're one of the, one of the, it wasn't just that the two of you were two different people from two different walks of life. You also, she, she didn't want to have, she didn't really want to have, um, a home and a family. I remember she didn't, you know, no, she didn't. Because that's when, kids. right? That's when that's when she cut and ran when your marriage really started to get underway, and the two of you were discussing, you know, buying a home and having a family, and that's when she didn't want any part of it. Yeah, I mean, she want we she wanted to have like a house, like somewhere outside the Jewish community, like in the Arab, but outside the Jewish community, and it was like a little bit above my pay grade. Like it was just mm -hmm. too much. Like this, this, like it just didn't add up, and I just I couldn't do it. I, I and I went ahead and I I bought you know my house now, and like that was like the nail in the coffin. And, and she just was like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm done. Okay, we well, well, it was gone to the tova, gone to the tova, and uh, you learned a lot from it. And Baruch Hashem, you got you know you split before there were any kids involved. Baruch Hashem, I don't think there was you know, ever going to be any kids involved. Mm -hmm. Oh well, <laughs> but, dog. She was she was into dogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I the, still the, have I still haven't seen that two hundred pound Italian mastiff that she suckered you into buying that disappeared someplace here in Florida. I don't know, um, but I better not see that thing in front of my house. That's all I got to tell you. Yeah, I mean it, it wasn't. I, I don't. I don't want to leave it on a uh, leave this story on a, on a on a bad foot. You know, she's a human being with feelings. Um, you know, she, sure she's, ha she's happier without you. Yeah, she probably is. Not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's more relieved and, and excited about mm -hmm. her life and probably living a better life away from everything else she didn't want. Do you know what? I understand something. I mean. That they took that mast off to Florida. The mast off ran off. No, Emma, that's yep. not that's not what happened. No, I thought it ran away. No, Emma, that's what not happened what happened. To the mast stuff. What? No, I'm not. I, I what can't. Happened to I, it? I, I can't say on the air. I can't say on the <laughs> air. The the point is, is that like it was a it was a whole big thing, um, but I'm, I'm not getting too far into this. I'm not going to get too far okay. into it on 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 the air, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving as much as I can without doing whatever. Um, I understand. By the way, you heard what happened when I was in New York that the cat escaped. No, I didn't hear the cat escaped. Yeah, the cat escaped. And I, the pe I've asked a few of my neighbors, people looking out for it. We still haven't seen it. Though. Two nights ago, I thought I saw it running across the street. So I called out to it and I went... You know, come here, try to come here. No, she would have no part of it. She's enjoying running all around the neighborhood, eating her live meat. I mean, every morning I wake up to a bunch of squawking birds 
that I don't know what they're squawking about, but probably she ate one of them. And one of the neighbors told me that they saw her about to pounce on a baby duck. Oh, wow. That we have her at, we have a little lake over here. So she's gone feral, could, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yes. But what is it between the mast up and the cat? Do we, do we have a whole history of animals running away? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's a long story. Um, all right. That's our time. We thank everybody for listening. Have any questions, just check out our Facebook page. Post it there. We're more than happy to answer them. All right. Okay, sweetheart. Have a good job. I love you. All right. I love you too. Mm. Have a good job. You too. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Jewish Boy Calls His Mother episode. Please like and subscribe our Facebook group at Jewish Boy Calls His Mother podcast and check out our YouTube channel, Jewish Boy Calls His Mother. I know you'd like it. My mother would appreciate it too.